Father, in Jesus' name, we just thank you, Lord, for our time in your presence. We thank you, Lord God, that you never cease to amaze us, Lord, with just revealing the awesomeness of your presence. You said if we were drawn near unto you, you would draw near unto us. Lord, we need you. We need your presence. We need your wisdom. Yes. Father, we thank you for your life. It is tangible. It is transformative. We thank you for your word. It is our bread. It is our drink. It is our food. Father, we thank you, Lord, for every opportunity you give us to gather around the word of God and to experience the communion of the spirit, the fellowship of the saints. Lord, we humbly submit ourselves to you this morning. We thank you for the anointing. We rely upon the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We need that anointing. And Father, we thank you that you will help me pull together the jigsaw puzzle that's in my mind this morning. And Father, that we'll be able to articulate exactly what it is that you want to say. We thank you, Lord God, that you will build us up, your people, your children, your own blood watch. We thank you, Father God, that we have an inheritance among those who are already sanctified, set apart. So you said, receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save our souls. Father, we thank you that the word is already blessed and our ears are anointed and our hearts are receptive to receive your word. We bless you for everything that you will reveal to us from your word in Jesus' name, amen. Well, bless the Lord, saints. Uh, this morning's uh, title and subtitle, uh, let me give it to you. A superior name than angels is our subject and the subtitle is going to be The Creator and the Created. We're going to look at verses uh, 3 through 6 is where we want to kind of focus this, this morning. And this particular portion of our study has to deal with Jesus is superior to angels. When we begin to look at verses 4 all the way to chapter 2, verse 18, it deals by and large with uh, the contrast or the argument the writer is giving about Jesus absolutely being superior to angels. Angels have played a major role uh, in God's plan uh, relate, related to how God would minister to humanity using the agency of angels. Angels, by and large, uh, are loyal. They are holy. They are loyal to Elohim. And uh, they do his bidding and they serve his purposes and they also serve us. So even as we're looking at this teaching as the writers of the book of Hebrews are trying to get across to this Hebrew church who is being encouraged not to defect back to Judaism, uh, that he is the writers are bringing an emphasis that Jesus is, in fact, greater than angels. And why would the writer begin to bring the emphasis to the fact that in a contrast, Jesus is greater than angels? It must be because angels have played a major role in how they have interacted with God's people historically. And it must be because it, it is not uncommon for humanity to place emphasis on the creature uh, over the importance of the creator. And so it is easy for humanity to fall into idolatry and to be uh, focused more on worshiping the created, that which has been created of God. And so it is possible that uh, in the historical context of the Jews' relationship with angels, they have fallen prone to the uh, uh, worship of angels. So, of course, the writers here uh, begins to deal with this fact here. So let's look at uh, verse number three, all right? We'll start there again. It says, the sun radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. I want you to, to, to understand, I'm reading here in the uh, uh, NLT, the sun, the fact that the writers are mentioning the sun uh brings him into direct relationship with God the Father. It is a relational uh, argument that's being uh, rendered here. The sun radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God 
and he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. We dealt with that last week. And he has cleansed us from our sins. He's, when he had cleansed us from our sins, he sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. Verse four and six is what we're going to really deal with, uh, four through six in our teaching today. This is a result, as a result of that, this shows that the son is far greater than angels. Why? Because he holds a place of honor. The son is far greater than angels, just as the name God gave him is greater than their name. So now the writer is beginning to bring focus and emphasis to the son's name or the designation that the son has by being given a more excellent name, the King James says, than angels. And I, I want to show you that it's not just the name or Jesus the name that the weight literally uh, is, is supported behind. It's, it's, it's what's behind the name itself. It's the honor and dignity of the person behind the name. You know, I was sitting here as we were going through worship and the spirit of God began to minister to me is that there are millions of people in the planet named Jesus. Most of them have a Latin, Latino heritage. And I begin to just see in my mind, uh, 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 imagine if all of those who were called uh, Jesus carried the same weight and dignity of the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus, that whenever it is that anybody called their name, something supernatural would happen in the realm of the spirit. But that's not the case because they have a name, but they don't have the same weight and dignity that supports that name. And so this is the emphasis that the writers are uh, trying to convey when they contrast the difference between angels and Jesus. And so it says, you are my son. Th uh, today I have become your father. God also said, I will be his father and he will be my son. And when he brought his supreme son into the world, God said, let all the angels worship him. So now the emphasis is placed on the fact that the created must worship the creator. And so here in verse four, this is going to bring out what the writer is really trying to say about uh, the fact that God has designated Jesus to be his son. Amplified Bible says taking a place and a rank by which he himself became as much superior to angels as the glorious name. Here it is. Title. What title? Son of God. Son of God carries weight in the realm of the spirit. Remember what Satan said to Jesus. If you be the son of God, cast yourself down from the pinnacle of this mountain. If you be the son of God, turn this stone into bread. Why? Because Satan understood who Jesus really was. Let me give you another case in point. Notice in the realm of the spirit, Paul was recognized by that uh, uh, unseen realm, particularly by demons. They said it this way. Paul, I know. Why? Because Paul had weight behind who he was by virtue of his relationship with Elohim. Paul was recognized because he had dignity. He had stature behind his name. Paul, I know. Jesus, I know. But who are you? And so the fact that the father has designated this title to the son, you are my son. The Amplified Bible says, taking a place of rank by which he himself became as much superior to angels as the glorious name title, which he has inherited. What did he inherit? He inherited a title, son. With that comes 
sonship, with that comes inheritance. From whom? The father. And so it says inherited is different from and more excellent than theirs. So there are many angels, there, there, there are innumerable angels and, and different classes of angels, and many of them have, have had names revealed to us in scripture, but it has nothing to do with their names per se, it has to do with their rank, it has to do with the title that supports who they are. And to help us with this, I want to look at what David said. It's a, it's, a, it's a messianic prophetic utterance here in uh, Psalms chapter 2. It'll help us understand what happened and what the writers are using to resource this teaching that they're now bringing here to this Hebrew church when they begin to distinguish Jesus the son of God from angels, the created here in Psalm chapter two, verse six to 12. I want to read this in the amplified in the uh, NLT, because this is where the writers are sourcing this particular, this particular thought. This is something that God had decided before time, before the fall, before there was even a need for redemption, God had already decided this. Why? Because God in his infinite wisdom and knowledge, he knew what would happen in uh, respect to humanity, in respect to how sin itself would be introduced into the human equation. So let's look at what David says. This is a prophecy. It is speaking to David, through David, to the Messiah. In Psalms chapter two, verse six through 12 NLT. It says, for the Lord declares, this is a decree, for the Lord decrees, I have placed my chosen king on the throne in Jerusalem. It speaks to David, through David, to the Messiah. David himself is a type of what Christ would become. Notice, when you begin to notice what, what, what God was trying to establish in bringing the kingship through Judah and David himself being a descendant of Judah, God begins to declare some things prophetically in David, through David, speaking of the Messiah. It says here again, verse two, for the Lord declares or decrees, I have placed my chosen king on the throne of Jerusalem. Now this speaks of Jesus too, because eventually that's where Jesus' seat of power will be as king. On my holy mountain, the king proclaims, now the king proclaims, watch this now, now the king proclaims the Lord's decree. The Lord said to me, the king, speaking of Jesus, speaking in David, through David, now speaking of Jesus, the king proclaims the Lord's decree. Yahweh's decree, the Lord said to me, you are my son. This is something that the father decided in eternity. There is no time uh, associated with this because this was outside of time. This is what the father decided. The Lord said to me, Yahweh, you are my son. Speaking of who? Jesus, today, I have become your father. And I want you to know that this has nothing to do with time. This is an eternal moment. It's an eternal moment. It's an eternal uh, event that took place in the spirit. He says, today I have become your father. Only ask and I will give you, I will give you the nations as your inheritance. Notice this, the nation is your, is your inheritance, the whole earth as your possession. You will break them with a rod, with an iron rod and smash them like clay pots. So then you kings act wisely. Be warned, you rulers of the earth, serve the Lord with, rever with reverent fear and rejoice in trembling. Submit to God's royal son. Now, here's what I want to tell you. When the Bible says that he has a name that's far excellent than the name of angels, it is referring to what supports, 
what is what is behind his name. He literally is the king's son. He says, submit to the to, to, to God's royal son, king's son, king's son. Now, this is going to uh, help us as we continue to study this book, because when we begin to look at the priesthood and as the priesthood changes from the ironic priesthood to the priesthood of Jesus Christ, we'll begin to see that it is a king priest. It is a kingship priesthood uh, combined function. It is a king priest function. It is changed altogether. So this lets us know that as God is speaking in David through David to the uh, to the Messiah, it is speaking about a royal son. That is the reason why he has a more excellent name than they. It also points back to the fact that Jesus Christ is God. Submit to God's royal son. And uh, and he will become angry and you will be destroyed in the midst all of your activities for his anger flares up in an instant. But what joy for all who take refuge in him. So the emphasis here is that he is a royal son. That is the weight behind this name, this designation as son of God. He is a royal son. Now, with that being said, when we begin to look at these first four verses, uh, verses in Hebrews, they summarize the entire book. They, they, they set the backdrop for everything that we're going to study from this point on. God has spoken to mankind in many ways. We dealt with that. But now he speaks to us in his, through his son. We dealt with that. This same man, Jesus Christ, is also God. This is what the writers are attempting to establish. The same man, Jesus Christ, is also God. And he shares in all aspects of the divine nature. That's what's behind this title or this name, Son of God. God's divine nature. Jesus' superiority over all other things is summarized in his symbolic position of son of God, seated at the right hand of the father. Everything which follows in the book of Hebrews supports this same basic thing. Christ is above and beyond all other things, which includes angels because after all, he created them. When we look in Colossians, the Bible says that, that, that Jesus created principalities and powers, dominions and all rule and authority. He created it. Now, for this week, we're going to look at verses four through six. Now, uh, Looking at verse four through six, it says, this shows that the son is far greater than angels, just as the name God gave him is greater than theirs. The name God gave him is greater than theirs. I want, I want to just look at uh, uh, John's gospel 16, uh, verse 33 real quick, just, just to show you that it's the embodiment of of what supports the name that God gave him or the title that the father gave him. In John's gospel, chapter 16, verse 33, Amplified Bible. Sixteen twenty three. Sixteen twenty three. Look at what this says. It says, in that day, verse 23 amplified, in that day, you will not need to ask me about anything. I assure you and most solemnly say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name. Watch this now. In my name. What does the name represent? As my representative. He will give it you. He will give it you. Now, of course, that is the classic. That's not the classic amplified version. So it didn't read the way I would like it to read. So I'm going to pull that up. Here is how it reads in the amplified classic. He says, and when that time comes, you will ask me nothing of me. You will need 
to ask me no questions. I assure you, most solemnly I tell you that my father will grant you whatever you ask in my name as representing all that I am. So this title, son of God, uh, attached to his name represents all that he is. And so it's not just the name, it's what's backing the name. It's the support of him being the son of God that represents all that he is. As I said before, there are many people with the name Jesus. And you would think that, uh, you know, if you just uttered their name at a particular time, it being the name of Jesus, it would carry weight. But no, it doesn't because it does not have the backing and support of all that Jesus is. Son of God, that title has rank. It has the character. It has the, the, the nature of who God is backing and supporting it. And this is why it has more weight than the names of angels or what angels represent. They're just simply uh, ministering spirits. Now, uh, verse four, again, through six, this shows that the angels is far greater than, that the son is far greater than angels, just as the name God gave him is greater than their names. For God never said to any angel what he said to Jesus, the son, the one begotten of the father. He never said it to any angels. You are my son that carries weight, that carries rank. Today in eternity, I have become your father. God also said, I will be his father and he will be my son. There is not one angel that has the distinction of a son. And when he had brought his supreme son into the world, God said, let all God's angels worship him. So to ascribe worship to angels would be idolatrous. And so this is what uh, the writer of Hebrews writers are trying to bring emphasis to is to bring Jesus into his proper perspective, because over the history, the Jews have had many interactions with angels. And in their own minds, they have elevated angels to a more prominent place uh, historically. And this is why angels had to deal with humanity in such a way that always brought their attention back to Elohim. So Here's a few points. The son is far greater than angels. The name God, the, ga the name God, him, the name God gave him is so much greater than their names. And there are many names of angels. We only know of two as we read the scriptures. But when you read the Tanakh, when you read uh, 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 the Talmud, when you read the Mishnah, you'll find that in Jewish tradition, there are many other names of angels disclosed because they had many interactions with angels. But in the context of our writings, we see two prominent angels. We see Michael, the warrior angel, the prince that, that, that fights on behalf of of Israel, and we see Gabriel, who brings most of the messages that and the encounters that, that, that most of the key figures in the Bible have had. Gabriel has been uh, a key, uh, key angel in bringing messages to humanity. The name God gave him is so much, much greater than the, their names. God never said to angels what he said to Jesus. The father never made a claim for any angel to be his son. The claim of uh, the father-son relationship was never designated to angels. So we established that angels are not considered sons. The eternal timeline of the father-son relationship was established by using the word today. That was an eternal day. That's a day where God decided that he would have a son. He says, I have become your father and whatever that day was, it was decided before the incarnation. Look at verse five here. In verse five, it says, for unto which of the angels said he at any time, thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. 
Now, these words apply directly to Jesus Christ when he's speaking to the fact that he says, I will be to him a father and he will be to me a son. They apply directly to Christ. Christ is going to become a son. He is going to become a son. And so applied, uh, it may be understood what has been termed his eternal generation. This was before uh, Christ had become a son. And in order for him to become a son, the father had to declare that he made a declaration and then it had to happen in, in the natural. He had to be born. And so in his eternal generation or sonship, this day signifies from all eternity, which may be considered as well described by this day, there being no succession, no yesterday and no tomorrow in eternity, but all being as one continual day. That's how it is in heaven. It is a continual eternal day or a moment without change or flux. And this refers to the manifest, manifestation of Christ's eternal sonship, sonship in that time, which was done both in his birth and in his life. When his being, the son of God, was demonstrated by the testimony of the angels. Because when he arrived, the angels bore testimony that he was the son of God. And so a superior name represents being called the son of God. This is the superior designation or title, which has a rank behind it, the son of God. It also represents dignity, nature, and character. It represents the same likeness as the father, thereby it makes the transfer of inheritance a legal transaction. And if, if, if you'll go back and you'll look again, he says, he says in verse four, being made so much better than the angels as he have by inheritance. That's the key word, inheritance, inheritance. Well, how does inheritance take place? It takes place from a father to a son. So one of the things that we have to look at because this designation as son makes Jesus the father's only unique son, but we are sons birthed by the spirit. We have, we, we carry sonship rank as well. If there's anything you want to get today, we have to understand that we carry sonship rank as well, being daughters and sons uh, by, by, by class male and female, but in God's mind, we are all sons. Why? Because inheritance only comes from a father to a son. This lets you and I know that we ourselves receive the same inheritance that Christ himself has received from the father. Why? Because sonship is necessary for the transfer of inheritance. So it's a legal transaction. Rank and dignity comes with sonship. Rank and dignity comes with sonship. So we can also apply the same principle to our relationship with our Heavenly Father. We being co-inheritors with Christ, sonship must be a paradigm shift in our, our thinking. It establishes rank and dignity in our relationship with God as it pertains to other created beings. Now, because of the fall, we are, we are in rank lower than angels only because of the fall. But in God's total redemptive plan and God's restoration of all things, we ourselves are higher than angels. So as sons of God who have been redeemed by God, we must understand that we carry the rank and dignity of our relationship with God as sons, the same way that Jesus does. And so his designate or his title of designation is son of God. This also applies to where we sit comparatively to angels in creative order. We long, we, we, we long with our fathers only, 
we along with our father's only unique son bear this relationship to our heavenly father. This bears out when the scripture states the following. All right. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 to 3 says, Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world be judged by you, are ye worthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that ye, that we shall judge angels? So this, in God's redemptive plan, brings us back in the final analysis, back into our rightful place of seating, which is higher than angels. Know ye not that ye shall judge angels, how much more things that pertain to this life. So sonship also infers rights of inheritance and the dignity that comes with the relationship to the father. The father-son relationship transfers ownership of all assets, ownership of all assets. And so it's important for us to understand that this word son refers to emphasizing likeness of the believer to the heavenly father, resembling his character and more and more by living in faith. God's, uh, uh, it, it, it refers to the fact that we are living in conformity to the father's nature. So when did Jesus become the only unique son of the father? This was decided long before his incarnation. Now, when we look at, um, and we read it already, uh, Psalms 2, it said the word declared in, in reference to Psalms 2 means that he would, would give utterance to or that he would now himself make a statement an explanation of the reason why Yahweh had determined to establish him as king on his holy hill. Remember I said this was a messianic prophetic utterance to David through David to the Messiah. This is a great beauty in introducing the Messiah himself as making this declaration. So it was actually the Messiah. It was Christ himself making this statement, presenting it now in the form of a solemn covenant pledge. The determination of Yahweh in Psalms 2, 6 to establish him, Jesus, as king on his holy hill is thus seen not to be arbitrary, but to be in fulfillment of a solemn promise made long before, when? In eternity. And is therefore an illustration of his covenant faithfulness and truth. The Lord have said to me, Yahweh, have said in Psalms 2, verse 2 and 2, 4. He does not intimate when it was that he said this, but this is, this is a fair interpretation that it was before the purpose was to be carried out into its execution to place him as king in Zion. So one of the things that we need to also understand is that this designation of son of God also refers to his kingship. And this is interwoven in the backdrop of what the writers are trying to convey. Because when we begin to deal with the priesthood, the difference between the ironic priesthood and the priesthood of Jesus Christ, it changes because now it is a king priesthood. It is a king priesthood when it comes to Jesus Christ. So right out from the back, this title designation has to do with kingship because there is an inheritance transfer. And so uh, that is an applicable to the, to the Messiah before he became incarnate or was manifested to execute his purpose on earth. It implied, therefore, that it was in some previous state and that he had come forth in virtue of the pledge that he would be recognized as the son of God. So the father decided this. He decided that he would have a son. The passage can be understood as referring to Christ without admitting his existence previous to his incarnation. And so the son of God designate is attached to the fact that Christ always was. 
For all that follows is manifestly the result of the exalted rank which God purposed to give him as his son. So this refers to the fact that before his incarnation, the father had to literally put rank behind who it was he was to represent or as a result of the promise made to him then. Thou art my son. This is Yahweh had declared him to be his son. He had conferred on him rank and dignity uh, fairly involved in the title, the son of God. So this title itself is what gives the name Jesus rank, which gives it more authority in comparison than angels. So dignity literally means formal, it, it, a dignity, formal reserve or seriousness of matter, appearance or language. It is the quality or state of being worthy, honor or a uh, uh, high rank office or position. So the son of God title gives Jesus a high rank office and position over angels. So verse four makes another reference to the superiority of Jesus. In previous verses, the writer has explained that God's message to mankind is now being given through Jesus. Since Jesus Christ is the exact imprint of the nature of God, he is the ultimate authority. These verses also remind the reader that Jesus is creator, and we've dealt with that. He is not a created being. So this is how the writers are, di they, they are distinguishing who Jesus is over the created. He is creator. He is not a created being. This makes him superior to all other beings, including angels. Now, why do the writers of Hebrews remind the Hebrew Christians that Jesus is superior to angels? Worship of angels and other beings was not uncommon in the day this letter was written. This letter was written. We have to re remember uh, the countless encounters that angels were having with, with humanity and even God's people as it pertains to how God interacted with them and even bringing the oracles of God, even bringing messages to them. Uh, there, there are encounters with, with angels and prophets, and we'll show you a couple of these instances where even angels had to interpret for the prophets what they were seeing in visions to rightly give God's uh, interpretive will to the prophet and so they held a very prominent role. And so it's important that uh, we understand that what the writers are doing. Even if an angel were to appear and give a different message than, than that of Christ, Christ would still be superior in authority. And that's why it's important that uh, angels hold their rightful place, but we do not lift them above because Satan himself was also an angel. And Satan has himself ranks of angels under him who can appear to be like holy angels. And they themselves can begin to manipulate, as we saw uh, what Satan tried to do with the word of God. So God does not want us looking to angels in that light. So the name of Jesus in this context is more have more to do with status and reputation than just a personal labor. Jesus' position as divine, his role as creator, and his work in reconciling God and man make him more excellent than any other conceivable spiritual being. The following verses give an explicit Old Testament proof that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, is not merely some angelic being, Rather, he is the unique and all-powerful son of God. And we read that to you already in Psalms. Now, it's important that we understand that this, this title, son of God, refers to God's only unique son, but we ourselves have become sons of God. And it's important for us to understand that there is a dignity and there is a rank distinction that comes with that. Remember what the scripture says in 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, sons of God, 
and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, when we looked at uh, Psalms chapter two, we saw that the spirit of God was trying to convey to you and I that this was going to be a royal son, a royal son. And every other son now that has been begotten of God, that means you and I are now royal sons. It bears out God was trying to, he was trying to get this across to them in the old covenant. When you look at Exodus chapter uh, 19, verse six, he says, you shall be a kingdom of priests. He was trying to get the emphasis over to them then that what he was establishing was king priests. Or, 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 or what he wanted to establish is a father-son relationship, a king and kings, a king and kings. And this is what is transpiring here. And of course, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, TPT, he says, but you are, a ro you are God's chosen treasure, priests who are kings, priests who are kings, priests who are kings. Kings and that title, Son of God, is related to the kingship of Jesus Christ. The kingship of Jesus Christ. This is what carries weight. This is what gives him a higher rank and dignity of angels because he is King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and he is also Creator. And so we see that the Father is trying to also bring our minds into that same dimension is to understand that as he is, so are we. He is trying to bring us into the revelation that the new priesthood is a, is a king priest priesthood. Even Jesus Christ being a king priest, the new priesthood that is established in the new order, the new covenant is a king priest priesthood. And we'll look at it as we begin to continue to study. We'll see the difference to how this king priest function and how we also also ought to function as king priests. Notice what it says in 1 Peter 2, 9 again, TPT. But you are chosen. You are a chosen treasure. Priests who are kings. A spiritual nation set apart as God's devoted ones. He called you out of darkness to experience his marvelous light. And now he claims you as his very own. He did this so that you would broadcast his glorious wonders throughout the world. Now, because we're dealing with verses five through uh, chapter two, verse 18 is really dealing with uh, uh, the emphasis of the angels and what their role really is, because the writer has really begun to uh, differentiate Jesus from angels and him being created, them being created. They do have a role. And we need to understand in this hour that angels have a role and that we ourselves as God's sons must use the agency of angels to aid us in all that God has called us to do. Now, it's important to keep in mind three important elements about the biblical revelation God has given us. Number one, the mention of angels is, 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 is exclusive in the scripture. Depending on the Bible translation, uh, uh, translation search, these celestial beings are referred to in the Bible from 294 times to 305 times in the Bible. References to angels occur at least 116 times in the Old Testament and 175 times in the New Testament. There are more references to angels in the New Testament than there were in the Old, which means that angels are still prevalently interacting with humanity on behalf of God. They're still doing his bidding and we must deploy them. These many references are found in at least 34 books. And the very earliest books, which would be Job and Genesis and the last book, which is Revelation. So uh, we need to understand that they have a role. Now, uh, there is a there is a ministry 
that the angels carry out on behalf of Elohim and God's people. And I just want to bring out a couple emphasis on uh, how angels have interacted. Angels as warriors. In the Bible, there are some uh, references to angels acting as warriors and protecting all that is good. One of these references is in the book of Daniel, which contains four apocalyptic visions. Daniel had visions and Daniel literally needed aid in interpreting the visions. And I want to show you how it is that he was aided. He was aided by uh, um, Gabriel who came and gave him the sense to what was happening. However, in Daniel chapter 10, verse 13, it makes reference to the sort of battle between the prince of the kingdom of Persia and uh, the, the kingdom of Persia and uh, the speaker who is believed to be Gabriel. Here, Gabriel tells Daniel that the chief prince, uh, Michael, helped him in the opposition, uh, helped him uh helped him in the opposition he was facing from the prince of the kingdom of Persia. So Daniel would have never known that while it is he was praying and fasting and seeking God at that particular time, that there was major opposition to his answer coming, except that Gabriel came and told him that your answer has been held up for 21 days. And so Gabriel comes and he gives Daniel a, thus both angels are acting as warriors for the good against the bad opposition from the prince of the king of Persia. In addition, in Daniel chapter 12, verse one, the speaker Gabriel says that the archangel, uh, the angel Michael is the protector of Israel, the Israel, Israelite people, and is a great prince. So God has assigned angels to his people. Now, Michael has been assigned to Israel. God has also assigned Michael to aid the church. Now, I want to show you this uh, particular account here in Judges. Angelic encounters in the lives of God's people was the way in which God intervened in their lives with divine announcements and instructions. So they have their place. What's critically important was their response to the encounters and how the angels wanted to remain nameless and anonymous. Angels are loyal to Elohim. They only seem to, to fulfill what Elohim wants them to do, no more or no less. They do not espouse any worship or any attention to themselves. They are loyal, but I want to show you this account here in Judges for the next 10 to 15 minutes. Here in Judges chapter 13, if you can go there, I want you to see this. Judges 13, verse 2 to 21. This is the account of Samson's birth, how he would arrive on the scene. Verses 2 to 21, it says, In those days a man named Amanua from the tribe of Dan lived in the town of Zorah. His wife was unable to become pregnant and they had no child. The angel of the Lord appeared to Amanua's wife and said, Even though you have seen, have been unable to have children, you will soon become pregnant and give birth to a son. Be careful. Now watch what this angel is doing. This angel is bringing a divine utterance from God to Manoah's wife, which is Samson's mother. He gives her specific instruction, instruction which we are now reading today as scripture. So they released the mind of God to God's people, which became scripture that we are now reading. Even though you have been unable to have children, 
you will soon become pregnant and give birth to a son. But be careful. You must not drink wine or any alcoholic drink, nor eat any forbidden food. You must be, uh, you will become pregnant and give birth to a son and his hair must never be cut for he will be dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth and he will begin to rescue Israel from the Philistines. The woman ran and told her husband, a man of God. Notice what she called him because this angel is not a seraphim. There are different ranks of angels. Seraphim mostly show up with wings. They, they literally can be distinguished from angels that show up who, who look like or are in the form of humans. She called him a man of God. A man of God appeared to me. He looked like one of God's angels, terrifying to see. And I didn't ask where he was from. And he didn't tell me his name. So look at that now. He does not even mention his name. He wants to remain anonymous. But he told me, you will become pregnant and give birth to a son. You must not drink wine or any other alcoholic drink, nor eat any forbidden food. For your son will be dedicated to God as a Nazarite from the moment of his birth until the day of his death. Then Emmanuel prayed to the Lord saying, Lord, please let the man of God come back to us again and, and uh, to us and again and give on behalf of God himself. Amen. Now, here's the point. The point, uh, the key here is that he had to point, the angel had to point the people back to Elohim. Hold on a minute here. Let me get the judges because I didn't fit. Finish that. It didn't print. It didn't print. Jesus. It's all right. It's all right. That's all right. We don't have to do that. Because here's the point. He says, man on him, pray to the Lord saying, Lord, please let the man of God come back and to us again. Yeah, I do have to go back and get that because it didn't print. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Is it so so quickly ran and told her husband the man appeared to me the other day is here again. Manan uh, Manano him. I'm using your phone and it's not working. Put it back. This is eight right here. Mm -hmm. So that was the rest of That's eight right there. Okay. Then a man prayed to the Lord saying, Lord, please let the man of God come back to us again and give us more instructions mm -hmm. about this son who is to be born. And God answered Mano's prayer and the angel of God appeared once again to, to his wife as she was sitting in the field, but her husband, Mano, was not with her. So she quickly ran and told her husband, the man who appeared to me the other day is here again. And Mano ran back unto his wife and asked, are you the man who spoke to my wife the other day? And she replied, I am. So Mano asked him, when your words come, this is the key point right here, when your words come true, what kind of rules should govern the boy's life and work? And the angel of the Lord replied, he be sure your wife follows the instructions I gave her. 
She must not eat grapes or raisins, drink wine or any other alcoholic drink or eat any forbidden food. Then Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, please stay until we can prepare a young goat for you to eat. Notice what the angel says. I will stay. The angel of the Lord replied, but I will not eat anything. However, watch what this angel does because he preempts, he preempts the response of humanity to want to give homage to an angel. He says, I will stay. The angel of the Lord replied, but I will not eat anything. However, you may prepare a burnt offering as a sacrifice to the Lord because the moment he knew he was going to slay that animal to prepare food, he knew he had to produce an offering. So he immediately says, before you even think about it, no homage to me. Mm -hmm. Manoah didn't recognize, didn't realize it was the angel of the Lord. Then Manoah asked the angel of the Lord, what is your name? For when all this comes true, we want to honor you. Notice his focus. Mm -hmm. This is, this is mm -hmm. the, this mm -hmm. is the, um, how can I say it? This is the weakness of the frailty of human flesh mm -hmm. to want to give homage to the created. And verse 18 says, he says, why do you want to know my name? And the angel of the Lord replied, it is too wonderful for you to understand. Mm -hmm. So they're glorious. Mm -hmm. They're absolutely glorious, but they're glorious because Elohim made him that way. They're part of his wonderful and beautiful creation. Then Manoah took a, a, a young goat and the grain and offered the offering of it on the rock as a sacrifice to the Lord because the angels said, direct your worship to God. And Manoah and his wife watched and the Lord did an amazing thing. And the flames from the altar shot up towards the sky. The angel of the Lord ascended in the flame. When Manoah and his wife saw, saw this, they fell on their face. They, they fell with their faces to the ground. The angel did not appear again. Why? Because God does not want glory ascribed to angels. He says, I want to remain anonymous. You don't need to know my, my name. Do your sacrifice only to God. Then the angel did not appear again to Manoah and his wife. Manoah finally realized it was the angel of the Lord. And he said to his wife, we will certainly die for we have seen God. But I love her response. But, but his wife said, if the Lord were going to kill us, he would not have accepted our burnt offering of grain offering. So my point here is that thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. My point here is that the angels were to point the people back to Elohim for worship. They were, in fact, messengers who carried declarations to the people from God, and many did extraordinary wor works. In the history of God's people, it was very easy to ascribe undue honor upon those who did a service for God who were not God. They are created beings serving the purposes of the one who created them. Countless numbers remain loyal to that purpose until this day and will be that loyal throughout all of eternity. Now, I want to share this last account here and then we're going to close out. I want to show you that the propensity for humans to have had those kinds of encounters with such majestic beings and wanting to ascribe worship or homage to them, and thus the writers would have to uh, differentiate the role of Christ from the role of angels is to bring them back to the emphasis that they are the created, he is the creator. But their roles uh, were phenomenally played in, in, in their relationship to how they interacted with uh, 
the patriots, how they interacted with God's people. So angels even had roles as teachers. And this is why we must understand that we don't entertain, you know, just wanting to have encounters with angels because this is how Satan brings his deception because they know scripture. See, angels in the role of teachers bec uh, become easily, uh, uh, especially important in the Jewish apocalyptic literature. We saw that in Daniel, Zechariah and Ezra. In Daniel, angels also assume the roles of interpreters and te teachers, nobly in their ability to explain visions concerning what was going to happen. Uh, let's look at this account here uh, with Daniel, and then we'll, we'll, we'll bring this part of it to its conclusion. Angels interpreting visions for prophets. So Gabriel explains the vision that Daniel has. In Daniel chapter 8, verse 27, you would think that, of course, the Spirit of God spoke to prophets. They got part of the revelation, but many times the revelations were so deep, they needed the agency of angels who were loyal to Elohim to come and give them the interpretation of what they were seeing. In dreams, they would they would uh, they would visit uh, these prophets and give the sense. And here in Daniel chapter eight, verse fifteen to twenty-seven, he says, "As I Daniel was trying to understand the meaning of the vision, so Daniel was having a vision. Someone who looked like a man stood in front of me. So Gabriel comes, and I heard a human voice calling out from Ural, the Uri River, Gabriel." Gabriel, tell this man the meaning of the vision. So Gabriel's commanded by God. As Gabriel approached the place where I was standing, I became so terrified that I fell with my face to the ground. Son of man, he said, you must understand the events you have seen in your vision related to the time of the end. While he was speaking, I fainted and lay there with my face to the ground. But Gabriel aroused me with a touch. And help me because angels have supernatural power invested in them by Elohim. He helped them to his feet. Then he said, I am here to tell you what will happen later in the time of wrath or the time of judgment. You have seen pertains to the very end time. The two horns ram represents the kingdom of me. And Persia, the shaggy male goat represents the king of Greece, the large horn between the eyes. He saw this. He saw these images of things and he couldn't put it together. And here's Gabriel interpreting what he sees. So thus he is actually interpreting the scripture. He's teaching this prophet. So the shaggy uh, male goat represents the king of Greece and the large horn uh, between his eyes represents the first king of the Greek empire. The four prominent horns that replace the one large horn show, uh, uh, show that the Greek empire will break into four kingdoms, but none as great as the first. At the end of their rule, their, uh, uh, when, they, when their sin is at its height, a, f a fierce king, a master of intrigue, will arise to power. He will become very strong, but not by his own power. He will cause a shocking amount of destruction and, and success in everything he does. So this world ruler will succeed. He is looking at the end times. He is looking at our day. He will destroy powerful leaders and disfast the holy people. He will be a master of deception and will become arrogant. He will destroy many without warning. He will even take on the prince of princes, speaking of Jesus Christ, in battle. But he will be broken, though not by human power. This vision is about three, uh, uh, 2,300 evenings and mornings is true. In other words, he says, what you see, it is going to be certain, but none of these things will happen for a long time. So keep this vision a secret. Then I, Daniel, was overcome and lay sick for several days. Afterward, I got up and performed my duties for the king, but I was greatly troubled by the vision 
and could not understand it. So what did God do? He sent Gabriel to teach Daniel the interpretation of the vision. So the writer, writers of, of, of this particular portion of scripture is trying to bring out the fact that angels had a more prompt, they had a prominent role in the context of, of God's dealings with his people. But Jesus Christ is the most prominent figure that anyone needs to give their allegiance to and is trying to bring these Hebrew Christians back to the revelation that Jesus, although you have had great encounters historically uh, in the history of your people with angels, Jesus Christ is more superior than angels. Now, I'll say this. I believe that it's important for us because when you go back to, let me just close with just a few scriptures here. Uh, Hebrews chapter one. Jesus is superior to angels, but angels have a role. We must understand their role and we must have revelation of what they do. And we must employ them in this hour. Notice in uh, Hebrews chapter 1, I'm going to read verse 7 and then I'll jump down to verse 14. It says, and of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers. So they, they are spirits, but they are ministers. They serve a flame of fire, a flame of fire. Then verse 14 says, are they not? He's, it, this is like a question he's, he's asking. You know, uh, uh, he, he's dealing with any contradictions to this revelation that Jesus is superior. He says, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who are to be, who should be, who, sh who shall be, Heirs of salvation, heirs of soteria. And then, of course, in Psalm chapter 103. Psalms And this is where we come in. Number one, the ministering spirit sent forth to minister on behalf of them who are the heirs of salvation. That Hebrew church, they were heirs of salvation. We, as the 21st century church, are heirs of salvation. It says, verse 20, bless the Lord, ye his angels. In other words, this is what they're to do, worship God. This is what they were created to do, not only to serve the purposes of God, but they were created to worship him. Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, they're powerful, that do his commandments, that, that are loyal to his decrees, his precepts, his ordinances, hearkening unto the voice of his command. The Amplified Bible says, bless the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his commands, obeying the voice of his word, obeying the voice of his word. Didn't say who has to utter his word. It says obeying the voice of his word. And then I'm going to close with this. Uh, go to Psalms 104. Psalms 104, starting at verse one. It says, bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless the Lord, bless, bless the Lord, my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty, who clothest thyself with light as with a garment, who stretcheth out the heavens like a curtain. Dealing with Jesus Christ again, as we dealt with last week, he is creator. This was this is exactly what he did, who laid the beams and his chambers in the waters who make up the clouds, his chariots. He, he rides on the clouds, 
who walketh upon the wings of the winds. Verse four, who maketh his angels spirits, his ministers flames of fire. This is what they are. This is what they represent. This is their role. And we must deploy them. We must deploy them. You know, I was reminded this week about how important, how important the angels are when it comes to the warfare that surrounds our lives. The myriad of things that are happening in the realm of the spirit that are affecting us in the natural, things that Satan is using to destroy, to harass, uh, to disrupt, everything that he's using in the realm of what he has authority to do, to kill, steal, and destroy. That if we remain silent why these things are happening, we are missing out on the deployment of the aid of the angels. I want to encourage you this week that whatever, whatever it is that you're confronting, whatever it, ever, it is that, 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 that is harassing you, whatever it is that you feel pressure from that other kingdom, because the Bible says the kingdom of God suffered violence, but the violent take things by force. We know that there's pressure from that realm of darkness. But we also understand that in the realm of the spirit, the angels are waiting for the voice of God's command, the voice of God's word coming out of us to literally minister on our behalf. And I want to encourage you this week, give them some work to do. Give them some work to do and understand that you and I are heirs of salvation. You and I are walking in sonship, dignity, stature, authority, and the nature of our King of Kings. And God is warning to honor us as inheritors the same way he honors his own unique son. I want to close right here by just praying for us. Father, in Jesus' name. 